just settling back into your regular meditation posture, whatever you find helpful for settling and clearing the mind, calming the body. And you can close your eyes or simply lower your gaze. No need to look at the screen. And turning the attention inward. And that initially means just feeling your body, feeling how you're holding your body. You know, it might take you a little while to find the right balance and alignment. And letting the body soften, relaxing the jaw, releasing the shoulders. opening the chest and belly. Just a sense of letting go through the body. Feeling the body breathing. Feeling the mood, the present moment mind state. Each of us is in our own environment. So noticing if there's anything in your environment that draws your attention, whether it's a sound or sensation, some sort of feeling of energy. Oh, no. In an ordinary meditation hall, there's often a sense of communal energy. So not sure we, we can get that. <clears throat> when we're not actually physically together. And letting the attention coalesce around the breath. Just feeling the movement of breath. The rhythm of breath. The sensations of breath. A critical element of meditation is patience. 
if we stay with the process, give it time. Everything will get a little more quiet and calm. The mind become more clear. But initially it can feel as if those possibilities are remote. That we'll never get there. So it's easy to get frustrated or give up. No patience derives from faith, from our trust in the process. If we trust that, that things will unfold in a helpful and positive way, then we can be patient. Allow that to happen in its own time. In the meantime, we bring mindfulness to whatever is arising, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, or just kind of neutral. Such a tendency to try to control our experience or to move away from anything unpleasant, to try to grasp on to any small moment of pleasure So mindfulness asks us to relate differently to our experience, to, to instead bring just a kind of curiosity, non-judgmental, accepting, investigate, investigatory. Mm, yes, well. And we sit with whatever is arising.
Patience means that we keep letting go of thoughts. Just letting them pass through. Don't have to push them away. Just notice, see thoughts, come back to the breath. Keep it simple.
All right. So, um, I, I spent a little time reading the section of A Burning Desire on right speech today. And it's, it's kind of a curious little section uh, where I, uh, this is, the book was published in 2010. So the, and then I'm describing something that happened a year or so before that, I guess. Uh, and, it, and it's not like a Buddhist thing. It was a sort of the four agreements. So I was with the teacher who teaches that so-called Toltec wisdom in, in Mexico. And, and um, so uh, just, uh, I, you know, if I had written this today, it would have been very different, but I guess that's always true. Um, it's definitely of a, of a time in my experience. And, um, and uh, you know, and as I reflect on it, it's, you know, I, I have to remind myself that this is about higher power and trying to kind of see the power of speech. So there are these couple moments where on this, uh, this kind of ritualized uh, practice we were doing with this teacher, I was invited to kind of teach mindfulness, but he was leading these uh, four agreements based uh, rituals. Um, and, and in um, some of them, there's like a, a moments where you, where you speak, um, but you're kind of making a statement or a commitment and, and even a, almost a vow or an assertion in that moment of sort of a, a definite um, co commitment or uh, sort of um, belief. Uh, and, um, and so that, that I think is, is particularly interesting because typically when we talk about right speech in Buddhism, we're mostly just talking about it as a, in kind of moral terms and sort of being skillful in speech. Um, you know, there's the sort of three elements they say uh, uh, in right speech to be, um, speak the truth in a timely manner and uh, without harming. But what I'm talking about in a burning desire is much more using speech to um, to transform or to to um, you know accomplish things. So the the obvious uh, connection to recovery is is speaking in a meeting, in a 12-step meeting or in any kind of recovery meeting where we, we see how, uh, uh, you know, how powerful it is to speak the truth uh, to our community. And, um, you know, and I, I refer to that in here. And I, I, that to me is, is really relevant um, to our, our practice and our path. It's, it, for me, um, you know, when I got involved in AA, I I kind of was hesitant about getting engaged and, and about speaking and sort of, you know, being a member. So, you know, I got sober and kind of went to some meetings, but I would literally stand in the back, you know, and I wouldn't speak and, and I would leave at the end and I wouldn't talk to anybody, you know, and, and that was kind of like the bare minimum, you know, and it, it, it it supported me to an extent, but but in terms of the real transformation beyond just sobriety that the steps offer, uh, th that didn't begin until I began to participate. And it's very distinct my memory of of how it felt when I first started to share in meetings. I'm sure many of you have had this kind of experience where. You know, you're 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 nervous about doing it. You're you know, hopefully, you know, maybe you're in a small meeting or you, you kind of pick the meeting where you feel safe and and you speak and and uh, 
It's this tremendous sense for me of, of something being lifted off my shoulders, a, a real sense that of, of unburdening myself. Um, and, uh, and something about speaking the truth about my experience, uh, you, know, speak, you know, saying it aloud uh, to people who are not gonna respond in that moment, who, who I can really trust are not gonna judge me. Uh, it was like such an important aspect of my recovery. It's when my recovery really started in the true sense, uh, went beyond went going beyond just sobriety. Um, and so, so there's that, that power, that power of speech and to recognize that, that it's very different from thought or even writing, uh, although writing, I think probably would be considered a form of speech, but I, I was talking about this, uh, with someone recently, about uh, the creative process of writing and how there how different forms of verbal expression, whether it's uh, or just you know, well, different forms of thought and verbal expression um, evoke different things and that so to to explain that, you know, having a thought uh, is very different from speaking something, right? And because speaking forces us to make sense uh, of some, to some degree, it's, it's not just nebulous, half formed or kind of incomplete or things that, diver, you know, just get lost and di diverge in different directions as, as our inner thoughts can. So when we speak, there's this different kind of thinking that happens. And then uh, in the same way, when we write and the, um, there's another form of uh, clarity that comes. And, and I was talking about this uh, with this person, particularly about working on any kind of creative writing or writing a book that, you know, writing an outline doesn't evoke the same kind of creativity that's saying just i'm going to start writing chapter one you know i'm just gonna start to type and and the words and let the words come through so there are these different forms of of verbalizing or mentalizing <laughs> and um and and so i would say the spoken and the written word are are you know essentially both forms of speech and and they have this power for ourselves to be very transformative i mean this is why we write an inventory you know it's you know in in the 12 step world because there's something that happens when we start to write down our experience rather than just speaking it so there's different forms of of expression have different sort of energetic effects and, and powers. Then there's the the other form, of, the other power of speech, which is not just for ourselves, but for others, right? When we speak, we are impacting others. And, and this is another form of power that we have to take great care with. It's why we have this idea of right speech, uh, because we can impact people so much, you know. And as a as a teacher and a public figure, you know, I've had these moments where I've said things uh, that really upset people. You know, it, usually individuals, usually not the whole crowd. They don't usually all go after me at once. But you know, uh, some something just someone just gets really set off by something I say. And, and, um, you know, it's it, having had people, you know, give me that feedback on occasion uh, has made me much 
made me try to be more careful in my speech and, and recognize and try to really consider what are sort of the range of effects that these words could have. And, um, and so this becomes like this other aspect of, of right speech, which is that we need to bring mindfulness to it. But it, or the, you know, the common term now in the, in the diversity world particularly, but it applies beyond that, is to pay attention to not just our intention behind what we say, but to consider the impact that might arise. And, and that requires this other kind of care and thoughtfulness um, and, and awareness uh, that's uh, very challenging. You know, so we start to see that that our relationship to speech is um, probably more complicated when we try to take on the idea of right speech. It's probably more complicated than we perhaps thought. I, I remember the the first time that I intentionally started to think about right speech. Um, and I, I, I talked about this not too long ago. I, I just recollect talking about it here, sitting in my chair here and looking at my screen, <laughs> as I've been doing for a couple of years. It was after a, a retreat I was on um, over around Christmas, just after Christmas uh, in 1992 with Ruth Dennison uh, down in Joshua Tree, California. and. She handed out the Metta Sutta, which uh, Mary Helen was referencing before. Um, and the Metta Sutta uh, starts out in saying, this is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech. And when I got home with that, uh, from the retreat, I thought, I'm going to read through this sutta. And when I come to the first thing that I can take as an instruction, I'm going to take that on as my practice for a while. And so when I, the beginning of it is a little more vague. You know, so it's, this is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness. So I, I didn't know what that, what to do with that. Let them be able and upright. Uh, okay, straightforward and gentle in speech. Oh, okay, that's pretty clear to be straightforward and gentle in speech. So I said, oh, that's what I'm going to try to do. Very quickly, <laughs> I saw how difficult this was going to be. And, and of course, it, you know, not only just generically difficult, but personally difficult, because straightforwardness isn't really my approach to speech. <laughs> I tend to be sarcastic and uh, you know cynical, and some people accuse me of being negative. I resent that, but uh, no, I, so so it really, and that was 1992, you know, and. Uh, is that what I said? 1992 uh, years. Yeah. So that's 30 years ago. And, and I certainly uh, have to continue that practice. I will say though, that, uh, you know, I've had a certain degree of success with that, but, but it's something that I've had to really persist at and, for those who've been on retreat with me, uh, you know that uh, we lead uh, these mindful dialogue exercises uh, in the afternoon on our uh, intensive retreats. And they, in those exercises, one person speaks, another person listens. You just have it, you're just paired off in a dyad. And and we encourage people to really kind of stay inside themselves and with their experience when speaking to just, um, you know, speak from the 
part. And when listening to just listen without judging, without responding. And one of the impacts of that exercise is seeing the power of speech, you know, uh, the power of listening, which is, I think, would fall under right speech, right? Right listening is, is part of this process. And, uh, you know, so, so the, if we can really uh, start to notice how speech works, you know, how it, how it affects us, how it affects others, um, it really can, it's, it, it can be very transformative in our relationships because I mean, that's it's kind of the, the central element of, of a relationship is speech. And, and so it, it's got this great impact in our lives, this social impact. So uh, let me finally um, see if I can talk a little bit more specifically about how we can think of this as a higher power, <laughs> because that's the, that's the sort of uh, thread running through this book uh, is, is all the looking at these different aspects of the Dharma as powers. And, and I've already talked about that somewhat, but what does it mean? This is kind of my persistent question, which is, what does it mean to turn our will in our lives over to the care of right speech? Yeah. And, it, you know, f- first of all, it means you know, being really committed to that, you know, th- taking it on as a practice, um, not just saying, oh, that sounds good, or like I'm okay with that, but really investigating, you know. Um, and I mean, uh, you know, I sit here often as I'm talking about something like this. I mean, certainly I will say in this moment, talking about this, I'm quite aware of my own failings in with right speech, you know, and, and so I don't want to uh, p- pitch this as like, well, when you catch up to me, you'll be spiritual. But, uh, but nonetheless, even though I, I see myself coming up short in this way. I also, and and I think this is important. I also noticed when I, when I do use right speech and that, and that in itself is a really useful thing, right? Like there's this tendency in the spiritual world and, and a lot in the 12 step world too, to just focus on, Oh, what do I do wrong? What's my inventory? What's, you know, uh, uh, where am I, what are my failures? And that's, you know, okay, yeah, we need to know that. But it's really helpful to see, oh, you know, right there, I didn't say the stupid thing that I was thinking, for for example. (laughs) Or, oh, wow, that I said that very kindly, you know, I mean, uh, sometimes words come out of my mouth, and I'm like, well, that sounded really nice. (laughs) And and, because in my mind might be some other version, right, which is a lot of what is involved in this process is, uh, is catching that. So turning your will in your life over means that you put aside that I don't like the word negative. (laughs) So you put aside the kind of unskillful or not useful words and you evoke some words that you sense will be helpful, you know, that will have a a powerful, you know, well, I'll just say, I mean, we're recognizing that these words are going to have power. Whatever we say, it's going to have power, good for good or bad. So, but rather bring up words, which will be true. So we're not putting, you know, we're not being phony, like, oh, everything's fine. No, we're being honest, but we're doing it in a way that's helpful rather than just 
uh, as one does, you know, blurted out, right? The, the uh, thing, the, the negative thing. There goes negative. <laughs> the, the unhelpful thing. And so it, it really, the, I think the key t- to this, and we see this in the insight dialogue, is pause, right? And I mean, that's in the 12 steps too, right? You know, we, they, you know, we're, we're suggested that we pause before taking actions, before saying things. And, you know, that, that pause, the mindful pause, it's kind of the key, you know, and, and this calls upon then uh, that element of mindfulness, which is to remember. This is uh, one of the elements, yeah, the, w- one of the elements of, of this uh, Pali term, sati, is m- to remember. And so we have to remember to pause and remember how we want to express ourselves. And once we do that, we're kind of, you know, we're almost home free. You know, we've done the hard work. The hard work is the interrupting the impulse, interrupting the conditioning, the habitual ways of being. And, you know, and that's so much of what spiritual practice is about and specifically what recovery is about because addiction is this deeply conditioned state which causes us to continuously and repetitively take unskillful actions on, which are driven unconsciously and we t- many much of the time we take those actions unconsciously we just keep following that right so to to stop and to pause to reflect is the way that we interrupt that habitual and conditioned behavior so this is the i think the the key element of right speech. I think, uh, you know, I mean, it helps to have some sense of how we want to be, but I don't think it's that hard to kind of know how we want to express ourselves. The hard thing is to do it in real time, is to interrupt those impulses and conditions behaviors <clears throat> excuse me so i think i will leave it at that and see if there are any thoughts or oh julie you've already got your uh digital uh artificial uh what do we call that hand up go ahead virtual there we go Good evening, Sangha. It's good to be with you all. Uh, this is a, a particular, uh, this subject is a particular interest to me um, because languaging and, and words and speech um, are all really, really important to me. Um, I've been highlighting recently the difference between uh, intention and impact. So I'm glad you mentioned that. But what comes to mind when it, tonight, is skillful silence, the lack of wise speech Mm -hmm. uh, in situations that it would be very skillful to speak up and we don't, and why don't we? And I think that is really, really important to look at. And whether it's under this skillful speech or not, I don't know, I tend to be very haunted by what happened with George Floyd. And not only George Floyd, I will use him as the example, but I would have been satisfied with um, any kind of speech, vulgar speech. Uh, What the frick are you guys doing? Save this man. I would have been, 
I think that I, I don't know what happened and what haunts me in part is what would I do in that situation? Yeah. It's easy to look back and say, this is what I could have done or would have done, but I don't know. Um, so I am, I think sometimes when we are silent because either we go through our inventory, is this helpful? Is this timely? Is this kind? Is it, um, and we are afraid to take the risk. And I think sometimes for me personally, I feel complicit in my silence. And um, I don't think that is skillful. So I don't know whether this addresses that or not. And I was wondering if you could guide me with that. Thank you. That's great. A great. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to even call it a question, but really just uh, something for us to all consider. I, in the specifics of George Floyd, uh, as I recall, there were some people standing on the sidewalk, uh, you know, yelling at the cops <laughs> and saying, what are you doing? You know, you know, stop, you know, you he's he's not breathing and you know there people were people were there which uh, as you say is very courageous because uh the police don't generally like to be uh interrupted um but i, I you know this is uh you're, you're exactly right that that uh it's not enough to just um you know be mindful and reflect you know there are moments that call for action and that call for, um, and not necessarily gentle speech. So um, this is one of the flaws in kind of Western Buddhism. I think that we think that skillful speech is always, you know, soft and smooth and sounds like, you know, everything is, you know, positive. And th that's not at all uh, wise when, when uh, really, awful things are happening and that need to be interrupted. So uh, the Buddha could be very tough on people. Um, he could be very direct. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not this idea, again, of right speech doesn't mean that you never criticize anybody or never uh, say anything negative, you know, it's, it's that, I mean, interestingly, you know, from a Buddhist viewpoint, the critical thing is the intention, right? Now, this, this more contemporary idea of considering impact I th it is very helpful, but I don't think that we should take in awareness of impact to mean that we don't ever want to upset somebody, you know, because sometimes people need to be upset, you know, <laughs> and uh, and so it's as with so much of the Dharma, when you just hear like face value, you think, oh, it's just this. But then as you start to poke it, just as you were doing, you start to see it's not so simple. And it, it really becomes, for one, it becomes something where we need to be aware in the moment of what is happening and how to respond. And it, there isn't always a formula we can turn to and say, oh, I'm supposed to do this, you know. And so, you know, we try to bring our intuition, our wisdom. And this is one of the reasons why we cultivate our own clarity, our own insight, so that when a moment arises where there is the need for an immediate response, that we are more likely to respond skillfully and make a right decision. But, and always understanding that even with all the wisdom in the world, you still might do the wrong thing. You know, you still might say something that just didn't that make the situation worse or harm someone. You know, you, there, there's no perfection in this in this path, you know, other than nirvana. And there's no talking when you're enlightened. I mean, I, they're talking when you're enlightened. There's no uh, words, you know, with nirvana. That's just like... Um, 
the unconditioned. So uh, anyway, thank you for bringing that up. And just, yeah, I, I, again, just it's really helpful to just remember we're not offering, uh, you know, pat responses and answers here. We are really uh, trying to examine things from as many sides as we can and then, then act skillfully in the moment. So thanks, Julie. Angela. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, thank you for tonight. It's nice to be back in class with you and um, yeah, nice to reflect on this again. It's been um, brought up some helpful things that I remember and then, um, you know, particularly around when I would first, when I first started sharing in AA meetings um, and even like before I would share, you know, I'd, and even in this class, I think toward the beginning of the pandemic, I was experiencing similar things where like, I'd really want to say something because I'm always so moved by, you know, whatever was happening and being said in the AA meeting or being taught here and what, you know, my mind was kind of, yeah, wanting to connect. I don't know, but like, um, and then when I would share or, or speak, you know, after I'd, I'd have a lot of, um, doubt or just stuff would come up, right. Like sure. vulnerable and all that. And, I shouldn't have said that. Why did I say yeah, that? Yeah. yeah. Or it, I didn't come out the right way or right. Um, especially sharing with an AA meeting, you know, but um, yeah. And then I've been, and then I was talking to a friend about this just over the weekend about, you know, speaking up and, and I think that is also what was coming up for me in AA meetings. Cause I spent so much of my life being silent you know, and not speaking up. Um, and, and that was the source of, you know, pain and real difficulty for me. But um, so yeah, that this like, how to discern between kind of what you were just talking about, like when it's helpful or all of that stuff. But mm -hmm. then also what was just coming up as I was listening to people talk and your responses is um, I'm reading a book by Kyra Jewel Lingo with another um, woman. And today the reading, the chapters that was about the eight worldly winds and staying calm mm -hmm. in the face of that. And so then I just was thinking about not self and how it relates to, you know, that like what we're talking about, even that, you know, wanting to like speak up or especially in the face of injustice or something, right? But there's like risk associated with that and it takes courage and there's that fear of like, oh, maybe, you know, if I do something or say something, then it's, you know, it's gonna be wrong or like even around the racial justice stuff, right? I know you were reflecting on that of like this fear of like saying the wrong thing, you know, like that's what some people, so anyway, but just, I guess, what I'm getting at and what if I left any time for you to <laughs> respond is like the piece of not self in all of this, you yeah. know, which I think is really helpful for me right. as I'm starting to put it together of like, and like what you just said that like, we're going to make mistakes, you know, we're not perfect. And, and it takes practice. That's the thing too, of just like, you know, and a practice of speaking up or not speaking right and pausing mm -hmm. and having those moments but also you know making mistakes and knowing that we're going to be okay no you know but yeah those, those are just kind of some of the things I'm thinking about right now so thank you yeah I, I mean you know one of my sort of quips I've made in the past is that you know, when, you know, thoughts are basically mostly the expressions of self. So when we speak, since we are speaking our thoughts, we are speaking self, you know, it's very difficult. Uh, I don't know if difficult isn't the right word. It's, you know, 
it's very much a tendency, you know, to uh, for self to get engaged. And it, it's really interesting to actually to watch that. Uh, I I think it was probably only after I got sober that I realized there was a way of having a conversation that wasn't about me, basically. You know, I, you know, it, it like real starting to pay attention. Notice that sometimes people ask you a question about you, and then realizing, oh, I could do that with someone else, like not really like didn't learn that early on. And uh, so, yeah, uh, it's so easy. And it's so interesting sometimes to watch a conversation between two people who are just talking about themselves. <laughs> we, I think most of us have probably done this ourselves, but, but if you're, you bring awareness to it and you see that like, you know, it's the tennis <laughs> match where the, none of them, they're, they're not responding to each other. Like sometimes what they're saying is like, and, and you, you'll notice this is one of the things we talk about in the mindful dialogue exercise. You notice how when someone says something, it triggers a thought for you about your experience. And then you want to talk about your experience. They're talking about their experience. You know, it's, uh, uh you know, so easy to fall into that. Um, so yeah, I mean, self and ego is is really uh, central to this whole challenge of right speech, um, and because it, it, it can work, it can be work the other way. You know, people who don't want to talk about themselves and just want to ask questions about other people. So the, you know, that you've got the narcissist and you've got the whatever enabler or codependent, you know, that are <laughs> perfect match, you know, perfect couple, right? Oh, I just want to hear you speak. I just want to speak, you know, and uh, that's, uh, yeah. So um, before people start, dropping away i i just was noticing and I, and thank you angela for putting things in the chat and people probably who come reg regularly maybe stop stop paying attention but just rem to remind people that we do have this list a contact list uh for people who want to just sort of be in touch and maybe find a sponsor is one like a buddhist sponsor if there is such a thing um so in the chat there's a link to a, a google doc uh that's just got people's names and different con ways to contact them email or phone things so i just wanted to highlight that and of course that we also have the um the donna options over there as well um uh, and a reminder that next Friday will be the Spirit Rock. Uh, we'll be on the Spirit Rock Zoom. And uh, eventually Spirit Rock's presumably going to have me back on the land. They're having retreats there. So I'm hoping that's going to be maybe maybe the next year. Uh, but for now, still just on Zoom. Uh, for anybody in uh, near... Um, North Carolina, I am going to be giving a talk in Asheville on September 5th, the Labor Day, which is at the, that's right at the end of the Southern Dharma retreat. Southern Dharma retreat is full. So, um, and then I'm going to be, uh, if you're in anywhere in the upper Midwest, I'll be in uh, a common ground in Minneapolis on September 24th and 25th. I'm going to do a day long on the Anapanasati and a half day on uh, Buddhist recovery there. So some live events. Um, I don't have any live California events right now, but I am anticipating starting to, um, you know, get out there and, and be live, uh, you know, early next year, certainly. Um, so, uh, 
So to wrap up, I will um, just uh, you know, suggest that you reflect on what right speech is for you and, and begin, if you have not been working on this intentionally, begin by just trying to be mindful of your own speech and not, start to notice the patterns in your speech. Uh, we each have our own ways of, of, you know, expressing ourselves and, and some mix of skillful and unskillful, let's say, and just start to notice uh, the things you say and, and notice the reality that you create with your language, you know, the, the beliefs that you express. Just start to let that be a, a reflection, at least for a couple of days. So um, thank you all for coming. I will be back on this Zoom on Tuesday. And so I uh, hope to see you then. Be well. Thank you.